Good morning. I call, Good morning. I call this 141st, 141st meeting of Salem Presbytery to order. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this day that brings us together to do the work of Salem Presbytery, sharing our faith, hope, and love as we make decisions for the good of each other and our members throughout this region of North Carolina and Salem Presbytery and the Senate of Mid-Atlantic. We ask your guidance and we pray that our vision by the grace of God and the working of the Holy Spirit will yield bountiful blessings throughout this land. Lord, grant us peace throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are beginning our time together today with a service of worship led by Dr. Tony Della Rosa who is being installed as our new executive presbyter. Our worship includes the celebration of Holy Communion. So I encourage you to have bread and wine or something to drink ready for this service. We will now be led in worship by Dr. Tony De La Rosa. Think what we have to call the world. The world belongs to God. The earth and all its people. How good and lovely it is. To live together in unity. Love and faith come together. Let's be prepared. If the Lord's disciples keep silent, these stones will shout aloud. God, open our lips. And, and our mouths will proclaim Bring your praise. The prophet Paul Return to the Lord with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Bend your hearts and not your clothing. For God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abound in steadfast love. Let us put our sins and repent of all unrighteousness. Merciful, Merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have been a rebellious people. We have, we have broken your covenant. covenant. We, we have, have tolerated injustice in, in our land. We have, we have not shared our food with, with the hungry. We have, we have, have not sheltered the homeless. And we, we have, have not aided the destitute. We fight our sin ourselves, and we use religion to cover our deceit. We become a mockery of our spiritual heritage. The world looks at us and asks, Where is their God? Forgive us. Subdue our rebellious hearts and restore us from the light of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you remove the other from among you, the pointing of silver, the seeking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. In the name of Jesus Christ, know that we are forgiven and rejoice. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I now call your attention to page four in the packet where we have the commissioning of a CRE and in installation as executive presbyter. I also call the moderator of the Committee on Ministry, Reverend Felicia Hoyle, to assist in this service. 
We come now to Commission Elder Tony De La Rosa for pastoral service to Salem Presbytery and to install him as our Executive Presbyter. The call of Christ is to willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life we enter through baptism. Discipleship is both a gift and a commitment, an offering and a responsibility. God has called you to a particular service as a commission ruling elder and as our executive presbyter. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will. Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit? I will, with God's help. Presbytery members, elder commissioners, educators, and other church staff, do you confirm the call of Tony, the call of God to Tony as commissioned ruling elder and executive presbyter in the service of Jesus Christ? We do. We do. We do. We do. Will you support and encourage Tony in this ministry? We will. We will. We will. We will. May we pray. Almighty God, in every age you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your loyal people. We thank you for Tony, whom you have called to serve you in and for Salem Presbytery. Give him gifts for the work of ministry. Fill him with your Holy Spirit so that he may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and live as Christ's faithful disciple. And God of grace and baptism, you have called us, Salem Presbytery, to a common ministry as ambassadors of Christ, trusting us with the message of reconciliation. Give us courage and discipline to follow where your servants rightly lead us, that together we may declare your wonderful deeds and show your love to the world through Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Amen. Commission Ruling Elder Tony De La Rosa, you are commissioned to service as a ruling elder and installed as Salem's Executive Presbyter. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, friends. Friends, we turn now to the reading of scripture from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and then 12 through 17. Hear the word of God to the prophet Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mouth. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like madness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army come. Their light has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet, even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a great offering, 
the drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even the infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Hear unto me, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Let me warn you up front, this message is a preview of coming attractions. Today is supposed to be Weight Challenged Tuesday, a day of beads and bourbon and cakes and cakewalks, revelry and excess. A close to our observance of the season of Epiphany, when the Christ child was made known to humankind, and as a result, made to flee for his safety to another country. Some of our sanctuaries are, are still bedecked in pyramids of Epiphany's green, of promised spring of life anew. And even our seasonal oracle, the groundhog, is loath to bring down these harbingers of better weather ahead. Tomorrow, however, will be another story. And the schizophrenic tension between the profane and the sacred embedded in our Western calendar, we will be faced with two wholly separate and clashing observances. Valentine's Day on the one hand, and Ash Wednesday on the other. What is one to do with the conjoined and contradictory rituals this coming day will entail? Chocolates, fat, roses, thorn, candle, ashes. What will be the right attitude to bear in a time that will bring both passionate eros and penitential regret to the fore? To borrow shamelessly from the hymnist, how does the preacher cry out? You think about it, though, I rather suspect we've all been there. Somewhere in your history, you could think of those relationships which started off so very well and ended so very painfully. Relationships which began with the heady hope of only good things to come when joy and desire were intermixed with stomach butterflies and anticipation. Love was so good and welcome then. And we relished the moments together, basking in the haze of true romance that Valentine's obsess over. 
the passion that's ritualized with gifts and cards that demonstrate our love and its extent. I will confess to you that I am a Scrooge when it comes to Valentine's Day. Not because of its sentiments, but because of its capitalist discounting of love declared every ides of February. Surprise your love with flowers and a romantic meal on January 14th, March 14th instead, then tell me it isn't true. But then, love goes on so well until it doesn't. When the acid test of exposure to reality brings us back to our senses. We will look upon our one true love and then realize they are not all we saw, all we hoped. Sometimes we can only look back and shudder, maybe even shed a tear or two before we turn our backs and move on. Some of us may have needed to escape for our own protection. Maybe we have learned something about true love as a result, and maybe, maybe we learned something about ourselves in the process. Only the lucky and only the cloistered, it seems, escape the devastating sting of love's labor lost. Thoughts, turbulent relationship with the feisty and recalcitrant people of Israel generates a lot of prophetic ink in the Old Testament, and the book of Joel is no exception. This Tavern book of only three chapters tells us that things are not well between God and God's chosen. The honeymoon, if there ever was one, is over. The people of Israel have been permitted to return from their Babylonian captivity to their homeland by their new Persian overlords. But what should have been a cause of gratitude and remembrance on par with the observance of Passover from the former exile was anything but a celebration. Passages from Ephraim and Messiah reveal how the people of Israel struggled and bickered in the face of incredible and gracious fortune. There was no love and roses to the loving God and a grateful people like their ancestors in the Sinai. The people of Israel were an ungrateful and contentious lot. Israel paid a heavy price for its dissension. In today's reading from Joel, the prophet raises the curtain on a scene of chaos and disorder, probably written several decades after the Israelites' unsteady return from Babylon. The book of Joel describes a monumental disaster that has already taken place in the restored promised land and omens portend of even greater destruction ahead. Joel wails at the situation, saying, The day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Any semblance of a loving relationship between God and God's people is on the rocks. Israel is about to pay a for its transgression. 
But then, there's a choice. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Despite Israel's misdeeds that would otherwise bring a stormy end to the strongest of Amorous Union, after all the betrayal, all the calumny, all the lies, all the infidelity, all the promises made and broken, God says, yet even now, return to me. This is why God's grace is irresistible. No matter how hard we try to undermine this relationship, God persists in loving us. God encourages and even wants us to turn away from our wrongdoing and turn toward God. What's more? That the little things matter. No. Not wrenching displays of penitence, no self flagellation, no blood sacrifice here, no, just a gathering of the faithful in solemn assembly and a cry for forgiveness. That is what moves God to forgive and to forget. Let bygones be bygones. And once again embrace God's beloved people as before all the iniquities came to pass. It all seems so easy, too easy. Then ask yourself if the God of our salvation conditions grace on our obedience. If nothing else, our reformed faith tells us that the answer to that question is no. God is some. And God persists in loving Israel and loving us unceasing. So now we gather here this morning in solemn assembly both celebrating God's grace and praying for God's forgiveness. Hearing the word proclaimed that lifts us up and challenges us to be better. Feasting on life anew in Christ from a table commemorating his living sacrifice. These otherwise incompatible observances, this love and this repentance, we hold together in dynamic tension because our faith dares us to believe that we can hold two competing ideas together at once in both our hearts and our minds. When you think about it, that tension underlies all of the relationships. Our truly beloved never really ceases being our beloved, even when we want to kill them for infractions small or large. Like God's love for us, the strongest love persists in the face of all that may challenge. So, go ahead and give those flowers and chocolates and greeting cards. Express the love you know to be true tomorrow. And then go don some ashes that testify to your affection. Ask for forgiveness. God Amen.
Brothers and sisters, let us join now together in a declaration of our faith. We trust in God, whom Jesus we called call Father. In, in sovereign love, sovereign love, God created God the world, created good, the world, and makes everyone equally, equally in God's image, in image of every race and people. Every race and people to live as one community. Yeah, as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in other and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet, God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people as all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ, Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful still. And now as we are blessed, may we use this time to pray on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Let us pray. O Holy One, in this sacred time and space, we enter into your presence, giving thanks that we can receive and bring to you what weighs on our hearts, knowing that everything, everything is heard by you, and all of it is received with deep and abiding love and compassion. In this new year, in this new chapter, in this presbytery, hear us now as we pray for you to bring us energy that we may listen fully, compassionately, and without judgment of one another that we may seek the common good above our own individual needs or our church's interests. Bring energy to churches who are worn down by the challenge of embracing the uncertainty of transformation. Do not let us confuse the busyness of being your church with the business of bringing life to your kingdom. Bring us intelligence that we as leaders Practice discernment, impart patience for us to not be distracted from the path of your light, impart wisdom for us to understand the radical love of your kingdom, acknowledging that our measures of success are not always the kingdom's measures, impart the ability for us to be open to this new season of life, that the lives we live in your service shine your light, a light of hope into all the world. Bring imagination to our churches writing our next chapter in your story. Give them peace in places of sadness, of fear, of anxiety, in what is hard to imagine or hard to accept. Guard our hearts and minds and spirits that we will be open and accepting and willing to be transformed by you for your purposes. O oh Lord, our God, bring love that all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit are blanketed in your tender care. Help us to never forget the rich and priceless voices of our black brothers and sisters who have shaped our history and enriched our ministries. Bring love that we may embrace diversity and inclusivity with a courage that respects and reflects the dignity of every human being. Fill our time together now with curiosity, with challenge and encouragement that we may love generously and fully. We give thanks for the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love of all who selflessly serve your children throughout this presbytery. 
for those who are now completing their terms and for those beginning new terms. Bring love that we will be friends among our colleagues, seeking to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ in all that we do. All of this, we pray in the strong name of the one who leads us, guides us, loves us, and teaches us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in it heaven. Is in heaven. Give, us Give us this day, day our, daily, our daily, bread, daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the gracious words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I cast out. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give out thanks to praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. You are our God and we are the creatures of your hand. You made us from the dust of the earth, breathe into us the breath of life and set us in your world to love and serve you. When we rejected your love and ignored your wisdom, you did not reject us. You loved us still and called us, called us to turn again to you in obedience and love. Therefore, we pray you, joining our voices in the, with the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place for forever, to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of our might. Heaven, earth, heaven, earth, all of your glory. In the Blessed comes the name of the Lord. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Out of the great love to the world, you sent Jesus among us to set us free from the tyranny of evil. He lived in one of us, sharing our joys and our sorrows, by design and love. He released us from the bondage of sin and frees us from the dominion of death. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, Read that after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Faith, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took this cup is the new covenant and sealed it by blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering all of your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine 
from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit, therefore, upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name. We may be one in ministry in every place, as this bread is body Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O oh God, by the power of your Spirit, to live as the Lord requires, to be just, to love kindness, and to walk properly to our God. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ until this mortal life is ended. And all that is earthly returns to dust. Give us strength to save us, to serve you faithfully until the promised day of the resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ. All glory and honor our Lord, Almighty Creator, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. God of compassion, reconcile your people to yourself. Following the example of prayer and fasting, may we obey you with willing heart to serve one another in holy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We turn to sing in honor of History Month, words that lead and guide us this day to a vision ahead that moves and inspires.
You want me to recite it? Friends, technology may fail, fail, but the voices of our African American brothers and sisters never will. Amen. Before we do, before the end of this meeting, we will solve our audio problems and we will get to sing that song one way or the other. Friends, we now, though, this blessing that will close our time of worship together. This is what Joel has asked of us to gather together in solemn assembly to lift up the love of God and to acknowledge that we are less. We do that in any healthy relationship that we do. So, Joel, do likewise. Throughout the day, tomorrow, and forever after. In the, the grace, grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all. Amen. Amen. We certainly want to thank Tony for that inspiring worship. And I was tempted to recite the words to lift every voice and sing today because it has meant so much to me all of my life and i hope that we will get to hear that music today i'm delighted to welcome each of you to this virtual meeting of salem presbyteries this is not something that we haven't done before but it appears as if today is the first time so we will move ahead i want to extend a special welcome to our newly installed Executive Presbyter, Dr. Tony Dolorosa. We are delighted to have you and look forward to the coming attraction. <laughs> We're grateful to Island Presbyterian Church here in Winston for hosting the leadership. And I am here with our, not only with Tony Dolorosa, but Elder David Vaughn, our stated clerk, with um, Reverend John Johnson, our communications director, Christine Ratledge, our administrative assistant, and CRE Steve Braxton, our moderator elect, who will be installed today. Since we have held quite a few meetings virtually over the past four, four or five years, um, our instructions for today, I think, may be minimal. I just need to remind everyone that if you're seeking recognition to speak, utilize the chat button and email or send, and send a message to me or our stated clerk. A private message may be sent to rec for your recognition. Please only use the chat for our business today. We will use it to vote by acclamation and we will use it to send private messages. To make a motion or second, please use the chat function to type in the word motion and type the full motion in the chat. Finally, if we happen to have a major issue, we will attempt to remove any disturbance and move forward. If necessary, uh, we will end the meeting and quickly resume as quickly as possible. I move now to the organization of Presbytery and establishment of a quorum. Stated clerk, we have a quorum. We, we do, do indeed. have a quorum. Thank you. Is there any new business? None. Is there a motion for approval of the docket? The second. It's been moved and seconded that the docket be approved. If there's any opposition, please so register in the chat. Seeing none, the docket is approved. I would like to, at this time, welcome any corresponding members that we have.
Do we have any present that we're aware of? Okay. okay. Yes, moderator. We have uh, the Reverend Warren Lassane, our sensitive and stated clerk. Uh, we also have the Reverend Barbara Styers, who is a member of New Hope Presbytery, but I, I'm pretty sure she's on our um, uh, pulpit supply list. So we have at least two. Okay, thank you. Welcome uh, to both of you. We're delighted to have you. Are there any ruling elder commissioners attending Presbytery for the first time? Any that we're aware of? Thank you. Any other visitors and guests? Oh, you have a new ruling elder, David? <laughs> okay, I thought I I thought I saw you pointing at one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Paul Sink has a new elder at Taylorsville. Welcome. Anyone else? Welcome to all of you. Um there's a new elder there, Jeff Hatcher. Catherine Campbell has a new elder, Robert Wood. Liz Troyer has Chris Harris at Concord. Anyone else? Well, we certainly welcome all of you here today. You are going to have the best day of your life at Salem Presbytery. So much so that you will want to come every time. Welcome, welcome. We move now to the land acknowledgement that will be given by Reverend Laura Musa Gritter. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. A land acknowledgement is a present tense and formal statement that recognizes the unique and enduring relationship between North American indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Indigenous people have not and cannot be er erased or ignored. We are grateful for all that the earth continues to provide. This acknowledgement is also an expression of gratitude to the indigenous people who have been living and working on this land long before the initial arrival of settlers from Europe. The lands of Salem Presbytery are large and were once home to many indigenous peoples, including, and I hope I've got all of them, the Okanichi, Eno, Sisipaha, Chira, Kiwa, oh, man, I practice this. Kiawi, Kataba, Shikori, Montan, Yuchi, Saponi, and Cherokee. Let this land acknowledgement serve as an ongoing reminder of our stewardship and ongoing partnership with the original inhabitants of the land where we live, meet, and reside. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Reverend uh, Musa Gritter. I now recognize our new executive presbyter, uh, Tony De La Rosa, for his report. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I didn't realize uh, at the time that uh, I would give this report that uh, I got a new title of a doctorate <laughs> awarded by Dr. Sutter. Which must mean something. something. Um, you, you can, can all sit down and just continue to call me from I'm more than happy with that. Um, I, I, I didn't know I had a doctorate, but heck. You didn't? I did not oh, know. Oh, well, you do. Okay. Well, Jurist doctor. Uh, okay. <laughs> you have it. <laughs> Friends, it is a delight to be with you here in what is now my first official. Uh, Presbytery meeting with the Sa uh, Salem Presbytery as your executive. I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. It is, you are in fact going to want to continue to come back. As many times, those of you elders uh, who are first timers, please continue to come back. And one of the reasons we hope in the future that we'll be undertaking reasons for you to keep coming back is that. We want to begin establishing a discussion with your friends to have open space conversations with elders and something who are looking to interface with other elders and other sections who are dealing with the same issues in their portfolio. So we can have folks who are 
are doing it with curriculum and trying to decide new curriculum to meet with other elders and overseeing education is in their experiences of different curricula and to test and sample uh, different curricula that they might undertake. Or we might have somebody who is interested in evangelism outreach meet with other elders who are doing undertaking these community outreach and organizing efforts and hear from each other, they develop practices and hear some ideas and to address problems that they have encountered. Or you might be one of those coming elders, every system has one, right? That who is finding that the fixing of that toilet that is 40 years old in that restroom upstairs just confounds him in reach out to other plumbing elders who have dealt with that same issue. Who knows that toilet? We want to be able to have the presbytery gap to be a place where leaders can connect and become even better. And so our hope going forward is that when the secretary gathers in person next May at Concord, we will have an opportunity to test this out, to do some open space conversation after that secretary meeting. So you elders who are new, report that back to your secretary and do let us know what the, that, that there are coming attractions in future presentations. We also uh, want to uh, let you know that I have a, uh, now I've been putting people at bay to, with to preaching in this season. And I've done that because I wanted to experience a full monthly cycle of community work when I might be available Based on my experience, I'm happy to say that I'm now accepting invitations to preach if you would like me to come preach. However, I do want to limit that to probably one Sunday a month, and probably earlier, is because uh, I want to make sure that I uh, devote my full energy to your COM and to its process when its various task forces meet during the fourth, uh, fourth week of the month, each month. So um, do reach out to me and do let me know. I'm going to, as I said, limit it probably once a month so that I have the freedom to visit a congregation to be sponsored to stay around. Moderator, um, in addition to my written report in which I describe the congregations that I have had the pleasure to visit, I have nothing else at this point to report to the Presbytery, and I do look forward to visiting with other topics. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And we apologize for any uh, problems that uh, we are experiencing with the audio at this point. Do we, just a moment, please. Do we need to? Yes. Okay, we will replicate Tony's report in writing. Sorry for the problem with the audio. I now recognize Reverend Sodomy, our designated presbytery. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Greetings, everyone. You have my written report. The theme this time is about making choices. And as I continue to walk with our uninstalled ministries across the presbytery, it uh, feels very clear to me that there are some very hard decisions being made and some very um, dark places that some of these churches are walking. As we prepare to enter this season of Lent, uh, I remind them all the time that 
we do have a Good Friday, but the Good Friday is always followed by the resurrection. So I invite you all, as you are working with your ministries, wherever they are, please, please reach out. We are a connectional, relational people. Please reach out to other churches within your particular parish, or maybe not, and experience what worship is like in their communities so that they can better feel that they are walking, we are walking alongside them. I'm going to yield the rest of my time, and then if anybody has any questions, you know how to find me. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Jody. I now recognize our stated clerk, Elder David Vaughn. Moderator, my report is in the packet today uh, on page eight. Um, as you heard just a little while ago, we will be at Concord Church in North Statesville in May. Taylor's Church and Logan Church are partnering with Concord to host this event. Um, we'll empower everybody to be together again. Um, if those of you who are on the telephone for this meeting, if you would email me with your name or affiliation for today, uh, that would be good. And many of you have already emailed or texted me if you're in a group watching and participating, but if you have not uh, contacted me and you are in a group uh, setting, please email me the, the, all, all those that are present today. Uh, and we will get that taken care of. Uh, moderator, just one matter for, um, for action, the action of the president. Um, the dismissal policy that we adopted in April of 2016 has been found to have a, um, a provision that is in violation with the Constitution, the Book of Order. Uh, and it is uh, in your packet history on page uh, 11, I believe. Yes, 11. Um, item section 4, item D, in the current policy, struck out words, appear to bind the session to a decision about dismissal. Um, but that is, in fact, unconstitutional. A dismissal is not among the things that um, that a session can, I mean, that a congregation can do. So we are proposing the strike out of um, language that you see on page 11 in the addition of um, the red uh, marked uh, words. Moderator, I would approval of this for me to second and uh, in order to sit. Do we have a second for the motion? We have a second. So it's been moved and properly second that the change uh, indicated by our stated clerk on page 11 be approved. Is there any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, those who are in favor of the adjustment being made, please, uh, those who are opposed to the adjustment being made, please so indicate in the chat. Seeing no opposition, the motion has passed. Thank you, moderator. That concludes my report. Thank you, David. I now recognize Elder Elizabeth Little from the Board of Pensions. Good morning, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, I am your church consultant with the Board of Pensions of the Presbyterian Church USA. I cover the states of North and South Carolina. I live in Charlotte. Usually my office is at Union Presbyterian Seminary, but right now I'm, I too am sitting in my back bedroom like many of you uh, working and listening to presbytery meetings today. Um, the Board of Pensions is one of six agencies of the Presbyterian Church, and we're charged with taking care of the members of the church. We provide employers with benefits, and those employers are PCUSA churches and affiliated organizations. 
I believe my handout is on page 12, and it even has a picture of me on it um, for all to see. Um, I'm going to start with Benefits Connect, and that is our system. And I'm going to start by saying that we and I thank you for your grace and your patience as we have been transitioning with our new system. It's been up for about five weeks, and it has been a test for all of you and for all of us. Um, so I just want to say thank you. For those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, is we have a system and each church has a sign on and that's how you communicate. It's how you pay your bills with us. Um, and we launched a new system at the beginning of the year. We've certainly had our bugs. So thank you for being the church. Um, and thank you for providing the grace and the patience. Um, as some of you might have been on the phone for a while or had trouble signing on, but we hope it gets better. You'll learn how to navigate it. Um, but right now, I just want to say thank you. The big topic at the Board of Pensions right now is called a season of rebuilding. If we were in the room together, I would ask you, um, has the church, church changed since the 1980s? And I think most of you would raise your hand and say yes. And has healthcare changed since the 1980s? Most of you would raise your hand and say yes. Um, the structure of the dues for our pastor's package with PCUSA has not changed since the 1980s, but it's changing in 2025. Two reasons it's gonna change is we need to address the sustainability of our current due structure as it relates to healthcare. And we also hope to address another issue. Um, there are folks that are being excluded from the benefits plan. Um, so we hope that more people can actually come into the benefits plan than are in it right now. So for instance, um, we've done a study over the last 15 years, and there's been a little bit more than 4,000 ministers who have been ordained into our church. Of those, 1,176 have not received benefits from the Board of Pensions. And 63% of those 1,100 people are women. So what is causing them not to be in the plan? Um, so we hope that more people will get access to the plan with the new structure in 2025. So what's the timeline for this? Um, our board of directors meets in March. So the first, the end of the first week of March, they will vote on it. And the pricing for the pastors will come out in April. So the new plan will provide flexibility for each church, and it will also provide transparency to the actual costs of health care today. So if something hasn't changed in 40 years, yes, 40 years, it hasn't changed, um, there'll be a lot of educational opportunities. Um, Felicia already has me on the docket with y'all COM in June, so we can go through it um, in depth and what that means to the overall presbytery. And then I will do be doing a lot of other educational events. Um, so you might um, see me somewhere in the morning on a Tuesday and the afternoon on a Wednesday or something like that, just kind of hitting many spots across your presbytery. If this is the first time you're hearing about this, I do recommend that you click on the link on my report on page 12. That specific link is to Frank Spencer's presentation at a mid-council event this past fall. But on our website, there's also recordings of virtual town halls that we did that over 500 people attended um, when we were doing our listening sessions leading up to the change for 2025. So that's a lot to think about, um, but it is coming. And so, um, like I said, our board of directors will be voting on the final finalization of it all in March, and hopefully we will start releasing numbers in April, and then I will be out and about communicating it. Let me switch gears to our assistance program. I always have to remind you that we have need-based grants for members receiving benefits through the Board of Pensions. So one example of that is we have a sab Sabbath sabbatical grant um, of $5,000 if a pastor is taking a, a sabbatical. Um, we offer college uh, transition to college grants for any of you folks who have children going to college. Um, we do offer a grant for that as well. And I'm going to finish with reminding you that uh, now is the time that most of you are having your congregational meetings. 
Um, in terms of call for pastors are changing, those need to be updated in our system. So I just said that our system is going through a lot of transition. And now I'm telling you that you have to get on it to make sure the salary changes come into our system, um, system so the pensions and everything can be calculated correctly. If you do have trouble, call up to our offices in Philadelphia, maybe have your patients hat on a little bit. But um, if you're having trouble signing in, I'll give you two words of advice for any of those trying to update salaries. It falls under a category called data collection, and you will need a so the social security number to input that. So those were kind of specifics, but that's what I've been hearing. So once again, it's time to update salaries. So I'll just recap the two top stories at the Board of Pensions. We have a new system, Benefits Connect. If you haven't logged on to your personal account, please do so. Um, make sure you start figuring out how to navigate it. And secondly, the due structure for the pastors um, will change in 2025 for the first time in almost 40 years. So, Madam Moderator, that concludes my report. Thank you for having me. It's a blessing to see everybody. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. We move now to Union Presbyterian Seminary and Ashley Anderson. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and thank you all um, for allowing me this time to be with you guys today. I know these meetings are precious and your time is precious, so um, I consider it so. But I am Ashley Anderson. I am the Director of Admissions at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Charlotte. And I, uh, like Elizabeth, who is, actually is down the hall from me um, normally when she's not at home, um, I'm doing a tour of presbyteries simply to update you about um, our campus, all the amazing, wonderful things we have going on, and just some changes um, should you be interested in theological education um, or simply coming to visit us. So... Um, the first thing that we have, and I'm going to do five, share five things with you, and it's um, it's all going to spell out union. So the first one is that uh, we have a unique model here on our campus. Um, several years ago, before the pandemic, we every class you had to come um, all day Saturdays. Um, that's what when I was here as a student, we had to do. Now we have a hybrid and an online format that is allows more flexibility with people's lifestyles. So students only have to be on campus one time a month. The other three, um, they are via Zoom like this. So it uh, allows folks from honestly all over the United States um, to participate uh, in our community and to be students here. Um, so secondly, uh, N, we have a new president, um, Dr. Jack Lapsley from Princeton, um, willingly said yes to serving our incredible institution. Uh, she was in Princeton for 25 years, but she did graduate with her master's from Chapel Hill. Um, so we welcome her back to this uh, area. She is an Old Testament scholar, uh, is focused on diversity and inclusion of our campuses, especially since we have, we are one seminary and two campuses. We also have a Richmond campus. Um, and she uh, is willing to take and face challenges head on and correcting those through justice, um, equity, and belonging. So we are um, just incredibly excited to have her leadership here with us. Um, the next letter is I. And this stands for the investment in you, our students. Um, so we have an incredible financial aid structure and scholarship structure. If you are a full-time student at Union Seminary, um, you receive 100% tuition. Uh, uh, we have fought really hard to get that for our students so that there we lower the barriers for them to participate in theological education. We know that uh, continuing education can be a financial burden. And so we tried really hard to not uh, let that be one of the reasons people could not attend school. Um, if you're not a full-time student, it is still covered. Uh, you can still apply to um, 
receive up to two thirds of your tuition coverage. Um, and that's just among a, a host of other uh, uh, merit-based aid that we have available for our students. The next letter is O, which is options for programs. So we have, if you are a lay leader in the church, an elder, and are just curious about uh, theological education or maybe um, increasing, you know, building skills in different areas, we have certificate programs. Um, we have your typical master's. So we have a master's in divinity. We have Masters of Christian Education. Uh, we recently relaunched on our Charlotte campus um, Masters of Public Theology, which we're really excited about. Um, and last but not least, our DMIN program. Um, so if you are a, a pastor in the presbytery and you are looking to uh, study a particular area further, we have relaunched our Doctor of Ministry uh, here in Charlotte um, and on Richmond as well, and um, can talk with you more about that. And last but certainly not least is the final N. Uh, we could not do this without you and your support, um, your prayers, your participation in our community, um, prospective students that you will constantly send our way, uh, and simply spreading the word about us um, are invaluable to us. Uh, your resources and the other end that goes along this with this is that we need those. We need the students, the support, the prayers um, constantly. So we just thank you for joining us as um, we continue to prepare and equip one another to be the church um, in the world. So I will put my name and contact information in the chat uh, if you are interested in having a further conversation or simply visiting um, our campus here in Charlotte. We would love to host you. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And Madam Moderator, that is all I have for today. Thank you so much. I now recognize Reverend David Cho, who is moderator of the Senate of Mid-Atlantic. I'm sorry, but we're having difficulty with uh, Reverend David Cho's presentation, and we will try to play that later for you. At this point, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we will resume at 1020. Thank you.
Let us reconvene our meeting. We will now reconvene our meeting and continue with our agenda for Salem Presbytery. We are going to uh, have the moderator of Senate of Mid-Atlantic's presentation. Greetings, siblings in Christ. I send my warm greetings to the members of Salem Presbytery. My name is Yunil David Cho, a teaching elder from Atlantic Korean American Presbytery, and I'm currently serving the Synod as a moderator, which has been a huge blessing. Although I'm originally from the Mid-Atlantic region, I'm currently living in Boston uh, to serve Boston University School of Theology, uh, where I teach spiritual care and practical theology. On behalf of the Synod of Mid-Atlantic, um, community, I first want to thank you for being faithful partners and collaborators in Christ, serving our God and God's people together. As our God continues to do wonderful, exciting, and new ministries in our synod and also in our larger church, we very much look forward to partnering with you continuously. I pray that we'll continue to share, embody, and really live out God's love, mercy, and justice in all the things that we do together in this challenging time. Thank you so much uh, for your presence, gifts, and commitment. Uh, and I really hope that you have a wonderful time of gathering. Thank you so much. Peace. Thank you. And we appreciate that opportunity to hear from Reverend Cho. I now recognize Reverend Jenny Henrick for the report of the Executive Council. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I come to you. My report can be found on page 13. Uh, in your docket, and it's pretty self-explanatory, and most of it is for information purposes. Uh, there is one item that was inadvertently left off of those things that we addressed on behalf of Presbytery, and uh, you've already seen it, it accomplished in uh, our service as it was that we uh, um, voted unanimously to commission uh, Tony to be a commissioned ruling elder. So um, that, of course, was part of the installation and commissioning service that we've already participated in, but it was not put in the minutes here that uh, of our business as the executive council. Um, so I, I, I'll ask you to just make sure that you make that note for yourselves. In addition, um, I would like to call on um, and recognize uh, two persons who serve with us on the um, executive council as they come to you and report on, first of all, the financial uh, status of this uh, of our presbytery. So I will um, ask on page 15 if uh, you want to look at that financial report and um, Is Rhonda here from uh, present? I'm here. All right. Then I reckon, 
I, Madam Moderator, I ask that you recognize Rhonda to make a report on the financial status. Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Moderator and friends. Um, on behalf of the Budget and Finance Committee, uh, our report begins on page 15 of the packet. Um, these are preliminary 2023 reports, um, uh, year-end reports, as Renee was still awaiting information uh, from the Presbyterian Founda Foundation to fully close out the year. Um, just some key takeaways from the reports are, first of all, from an overall financial organizational perspective, uh, Presbytery met its obligations for the year and remitted an additional $25,000 to the General Assembly per capita assessment. Um, that was um, made possible from the property sale uh, funds that were available to the General Operating Fund. Uh, you will note on the balance sheet that at the end of December, our cash in the operating account was low. Um, however, that was due to remitting that additional $25,000 to General Assembly. Uh, in January, we have shored those funds back up uh, as we began to get our 2024 pledges and we received some prior year pledges um, as well. Uh, the restricted hunger fund balance remained relatively strong at year end, and I'm sure that the hunger committee is, is in the process of starting their spring grant cycle. So those funds will be going out uh, sometime in the spring. Uh, the market rebounded in December, uh, and there was over $800,000 of investments available to the general fund in our Merrill Lynch account. Uh, looking at the statement of activities for the general operating account uh, at year end, Presbytery support from churches uh, ended up about 17, a little over 17,000 less than budget, but our overall actual revenue was over 25,000 more than budget. Um, additionally, our expenditures were more than 21,000 less than budget. So this resulted in year end revenue exceeding expenditures by over $47,000 in our operating fund. Now, when you factor in some accounting transactions for our unrealized investment gains, uh, proceeds from property disposals, and which is available to the general fund, and proceeds from carrying costs, which are used to pay closed church expenses, our general fund revenue was in excess of expenditures by over $302,000. Um, and that's not been seen for a while in our presbytery. Uh, on page 19, the report of fund balances, that provides the various transactions for each fund that poor Renee is responsible for managing for presbytery. Uh, when you look at the general fund particularly, the balances are not solely cash, but it's cash and assets. So when you look at that $1.3 million ending balance for general fund in that fund, think, don't think that Presbyterian is cash flush because a lot of that is non-current assets. Uh, our notes receivables from the sale of the um, covenant property, uh, land, building, and equipment. And then we have a lot of that tied up in investments as well. So to access the cash is going to take a lot of luck and timing because of the stock market. So I just wanted to point that out uh, so, so people don't think that, that we are sitting on this stockpile of money. Um, finally, on the church support report, I wanted to point out that technically your local dollars are not being used to fund the designated presbyter for transformational ministry or the El Buen uh, pastor position. If you exclude those two expenditures because local church support is not funding those positions, then our church support actually funded about 90.2% of the budget for 2023 and not the 69%. Um, I wish I had some visuals to show you today, but, but I don't. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. So on behalf of the Budget and Finance Committee, we thank you for your support in 20, 2023 uh, and look forward to your continued support in 2024 and beyond. And if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to me or any member of the Budget and Finance Committee or Renee, and we'll try to answer your questions. Madam Moderator, um, that's the Budget and Finance Report for today. Thank you, Rhonda. 
And thank you for the good work that the Budget and Finance Committee has been doing on behalf of um, Presbytery. Um, the news is not as good as you might want to think it is, but the news is better than it, certainly better than it has been in regard to our financial situation. Part of the reason for that, I would like to think, is because of the hard work of another committee uh, of the executive uh, commission, and that is the stewardship committee. I'd like to recognize Reverend Kyle Goodman and Reverend Kim Pretty as uh, they take us to the work of stewardship. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, Kyle and I have been busy at work, working with Renee and Rhonda, and they are a wonderful team to work with. Um, and as you said, we've had bad news and then the news gets better. And so we want to share with you some of the good and the, and the rough news uh, from this committee. Um, wanted to let you know that we have had 42 churches already pledge. And we're grateful that those uh, churches have done the work within their uh, session and let us know as soon as possible when the budgets were approved. So 42 churches, and that is our best start ever. On the other hand, uh, the rough news, and it's it's been the rough news for a long time, uh, is that uh, we typically have at best uh, 75, 80 churches uh, make uh, that pledge to our presbytery. So we have somewhere between 50 and 60 churches that never do that. We still have a lot of work to do. But we want to thank Greenwood and Hayfield and Vandalia. These are three churches that have not in the past pledged, but they have pledged for 2024. So thank you. Hey. Yeah, really good news. Um, and as you know, we continue to struggle with uh, church closings and uh, talk of dismissals. And so uh, there are, of course, a lot of congregations uh, that struggle both to give and, and really they need our presbytery support. Uh, beyond that, we've had eight churches uh, increase their pledge for 2024. They've stepped out in faith and increased their giving. And we give thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, though, several of our largest contributing churches have had to decrease their pledges, some by significant amounts. Uh, of the, the 39 churches uh, that, uh, that we have data from last year that have pledged so far, we're down about $25,000 in those pledges from uh, where we were uh, in 2023. But the good news is we still have 28 pledges that can help make up that difference. We need your support um, now more than ever. As we have seen that eight churches increased, we know that every little bit helps so that we hope as you are considering uh, finalizing your budgets that you are able to increase. Mm -hmm. And that 28 can be uh, 38, 48, 58, uh, if our if all of our churches uh, move and act to uh, make that contribution and offer that support. Um, we've got more good news. You can pledge today. You can make your contribution today. Pledge is the word we use, but really we're talking about a line item in your budget. And if your church has a budget, then there is a number. And all we want to do is find out what that is. Uh, you can email Renee Carter with the Presbytery office. You can speak to Kim and I directly. You can type it directly to us in the chat if you'd like. Uh, it's as simple as that. If you have a budget for your church handy, you can share it today and check that thing off of your list. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for letting me be the good news of our script today. And we want to encourage you churches to continue the hard work and dedication and are grateful for all that you all do. And I have one more challenge I would like to offer. A friend pointed out this morning uh, that uh, all of our churches uh, should be contributing to our, our presbytery, but there really isn't in the mechanism of how we uh, do per capita and giving an opportunity for our clergy uh, to give. And if you think about it, clergy disproportionately receive a portion of the service and help from our presbytery. Uh, and our church doesn't pay per capita to presbytery for us. We're not on the membership roll. Uh, so I want to challenge uh, 
uh, everyone uh, who's a, a member of the clergy in our presbytery uh, to think about making that uh, $40 contribution. There's about 250 of us. If we all made that contribution, friends, that's $10,000 that would go a long way to making up that uh, 25000 So I would invite you, encourage you, if you are one of the pastors in this presbytery, to think about how you might support a presbytery that I know at some point in the past, if not currently, is really supporting you. That concludes our report, I believe. Thank you. And Madam Moderator, that concludes the report of the Executive Council. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and thank you to the Executive Council for all the work that you're doing. I recognize now Reverend Liz Troyer and the Church Growth and Transformation Committee report. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I have um, just a few things to lift up for you. First, since we last saw each other in November, we have been able to offer two grants to churches that have applied, um, totaling almost $40,000. Uh, one is to, a, um, is to the UCO in Greensboro, um, which is doing an innovative cooperative ministry in the Greensboro area for our youth folks. Um, and so we were glad to help them out. The second was to a church in Burlington, which is um, beginning a community learning and outreach program in their church fellowship hall. Mm -hmm. So we are helping them to get that program started. So we're thankful that we can support them in that way. Um, if you are considering applying for a grant, you can do that um, monthly. You can email me and I'll put my email um, in the inbox or in the chat after I'm done. Um, we're gonna consider that every month at our meetings. Um, as they come in, we will approve them. Um, and then we're gonna distribute them at the end of each quarter. Like Rhonda mentioned earlier, there's a little bit of money movement that has to happen. Um, so we would love to give it to you immediately, but um, there are some, some things to move. <laughs> so uh, be patient with us as we, as, um, as Renee and Rhonda, move those things around for us to be able to do that. Um, and then I wanted to, um, I'm gonna share my screen so that I can show you where you can get this application. Give me just a second. So if you go to the Salem Presbytery website and click on this uh, list of committees and uh, commissions, we are right here. You just click on that and then this big right bread button that has the grant application on it um, will take you to up oh, see will take you to the place where it lives um, it is here you can scroll down and right there is the link to the application but there's lots of good information here on this page about um, how to apply uh, what you should do to apply and it also has um, an example of an application for you to look through so uh, in our fake example here, um, a church wanted to start a Christian community for reading with the dogs. Um, and so all of the things that you need to think about as you're doing that um, discernment work um, and application is right here. Um, so you can just go through it and see that example for yourself. Um, and the blank application is uh, right here on this link and it will open in as a Microsoft Word document for you to edit on your own. And so if you have any questions about the mechanism or how to fill out the application, the technical part of it, I'm happy to address that or to answer any questions that you have. Um, we are excited about what you guys are dreaming about and we wanna help to support that. So don't hesitate to contact me um, with questions or, um, or if you want somebody just to bounce ideas off of, I'm open to that as well. So uh, let us know how we can help you and support you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, uh, Reverend Troyer. Are there questions regarding the report? Hearing and seeing none, uh, we move then to the Commission on Ministry report by Reverend Felicia Stewart Hoyle. Moderator, let us recognize uh, the Reverend Travis Milam, who will report from the COM Task Force on Examination. Thank you, Reverend Milam. Thank you, Moderator. 
Uh, the report from examinations begins on page 22 of today's packet. After successful examinations by our task force, these four individuals were approved for service in Salem Presbytery. First off, the Reverend Dr. Sidney Davis, who comes to us from the Charleston Atlantic Presbytery as a retiree. Dr. Davis, will you please introduce yourself to Salem? Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be home. This is uh, the Presbytery from which I grew. Um, it's been 48 years in active ministry, and now I'm home to retire and to help wherever I can. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, having completed all the requirements to transfer her ordination to the PCUSA, we welcome the Reverend Patricia Green to Salem Presbytery. Reverend Green, would you say hello, please? Morning. It is good to be with you all, and I'm so grateful for your welcome. I come from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and I serve as a hospice chaplain with Hospice of the Piedmont, participating regularly in the life and work of Clemens Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Green. Uh, today, the Reverend Julie Hill, who is to serve as interim pastor at Sparta while retaining her membership at say, or Charlotte Presbytery, is not able to join us. She is uh, babysitting a newborn currently, so we think that's a fairly good excuse for not being able to be here. Uh, and finally, we do welcome Shannon Langston, uh, who is a the CRE has found uh, ready to accept a commission as commissioned ruling elder. Elder Langston, would you uh, say hello to your colleagues in ministry, please? Hello, all. My name is Shannon Langston. I uh, originally from Phoenix, Arizona in the Grand Canyon Presbytery. Thank you, Ms. Langston, Elder Langston. And moderator, that concludes the report of the Examinations Task Force. I ask that you would please lead us in the liturgy of welcome that is found on page 29 of today's packet. Thank you. We move to the liturgy on page 29. Sorry. As in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, for many, are one body and part. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. In ministering, the teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity. The leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let us not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit, serving the Lord. We remember, we remember with joy to serve others, and we celebrate the God's for to our brothers and sisters of Christ, as they serve among us as teaching elders. As you join us in ministry, <clears throat> Salem Presbytery remembers some of our constitutional responsibilities to ministers and congregations. As ruling and teaching, and teaching elders, we come to provide resources, resources guidance, encouragement, encouragement and, and mutual support to you as members. as members of our presbytery. Thank you. Let us join together in prayer. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Shannon, Patricia, and Sydney to this time and place. Establish them in your truth and guide them by your Holy Spirit that in your service they may grow in faith, hope, and love. Help us as Salem Presbytery to be faithful to our responsibilities of mutual love and encouragement and support as we serve together 
that we, we may all be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. We now return to Reverend Felicia Stewart Hoyle and the Commission on Ministry Report. Thank you. Um, I draw the Presbytery's attention to section one and section two of the COM report, which begins on page 30 of your packet uh, with the COM action reported for information as well as COM actions taken on behalf of Salem Presbytery. So as you come to find that, um, I, I want to also just express as I'm starting appreciation to Amanda Covington and to John Johnson, who have completed terms uh, on the Commission on Ministry. Amanda is the one that you've seen in front of you uh, so often, and she has done a, a lion's share of work in this new structure that the COM is um, working under and is part of. And also, as we begin the new year, I wanted to let you know that the COM um, has had its first all COM meeting and training in a number of years since pre-COVID. Uh, and you, Salem Presbytery, have an incredible team of people who are working on your behalf. Uh, and I, I just commend all of them and their work to you. So now um, I draw everyone's attention to section three of the COM report on page 32 of your packet, uh, recommendations for the action of Presbytery. And I draw the Presbytery's attention to section three, item A, elders to celebrate communion. Uh, you've already seen uh, from the executive council act on the Presbytery's behalf um, has approved Elder Wade, Wade Balsley to serve communion at Speedwell. And all of these elders uh, will be trained. In fact, I believe have been trained already uh, by yeah. West Pitts. So on behalf of the COM, I move approval of section three, item A. Okay, we have a motion from the COM to approve section three, item A. Are there any questions? Hearing none, is there any opposition to approval of this motion? Seeing and hearing none, the motion is passed. Uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Jim Beard uh, has long served the Emmanuel congregation as its CRE pastoral leader. And until recently, uh, Jim has, had, has given tremendous service and leadership uh, to the Commission on Ministry as well. So we recognize his retirement, and I ask that you lead us in the liturgy found on page 33. Thank you. James Beard was clothed with Christ in baptism and called by God through the voice of the church to give particular service as a commissioned ruling elder. And celebrate God's call to all who minister among us. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for your servant, Jim, whose ministry we recognize today. We praise you for joys and accomplishments and for your grace, which has nurtured and sustained him and the Emmanuel congregation. We recognize Jim's ministry. We also pray for the Emmanuel Church congregation. Bind them ever closer to one another as they bear witness to your saving grace in Jesus Christ, in whose name we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. Moderator, this concludes the COM report. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I call your attention now to the Committee on Representation, Reverend Sam Perkins. Thank you, Moderator. Uh, I am pleased to inform you that uh, I don't have to uh, 
come down hard on anyone because we have done a really good job answering the call uh, to fill our uh, vacancies for our committees, commissions, and, and task forces here in this this last uh, round of, of nominations. And so you can see the slate uh, there in your uh, in your uh, uh, your your report. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I will note that uh, we we just welcomed Reverend Sidney Davis, and we we already put him to work. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Reverend Davis, thank you for uh, your graciousness and, and for your willingness to continue serving here in Salem Presbytery uh, or on behalf of Salem Presbytery uh, in our Senate. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is the, the slate to be voted on. Uh, and moderator, I would uh, turn it over to you for that vote. Thank you. We see the report on page 34 from the Committee on Representation. Uh, the motion from the committee is that it be let approved. Me, let me, can, can I interrupt you quickly? Uh, I saw that uh, Reverend Sink just uh, made a note that uh, there there is one mistake, so we'll have to make a friendly amendment that uh, Elder Corey Earp uh, has has not responded or has not accepted that nomination for church growth and transformation. So if we can just uh, include that as a, a an amendment to that uh, slate, that he should not be approved today. Correct. Not included on that. Yeah. Not included. Thank you. Yeah. Are there nominations from the floor? Hearing and seeing none, the motion from the committee has come. All, uh, is there any opposition to the nominations that have been made? Seeing and hearing none. The motion is passed. Thank you, Reverend Perkins. You're welcome. This concludes our report. Thank you. I call your attention now to the Peace and Justice Task Force Committee, Elder Karen Worley. Hello. Hello. So can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're about to hear more about the Matthew 25 Summit but you know the concept already. We're living into the ideas of revitalizing congregations, dismantling structural racism, and eradicating systemic poverty. Part of the dismantling is getting us all onto the same page about the structures that we're working to dismantle. So we, as a presbytery, agreed to require a racial equity equipping, aka training, for all teaching elders, CREs, certified Christian educators, members at large, and presbytery staff, and to recommend it for others serving the presbytery. We all voted for this because we think it's important. So please save time in your busy life this year or next to take this training. This year, the dates of it are February 24th, May 16th, and September 28th. Then in the area of poverty, Part of working to eradicate it is showing up for the people who are in poverty and for people who are already working diligently on that eradication. The Poor People's Campaign has called for marches in the state capitals of the United States on Saturday, March the 2nd, to demand justice for poor people in our country. Imagine how politicians might react if a huge number of people showed up for these events, showing that there are a lot of voters who support justice for poor people. So we want to do our part. Salem Presbytery members are encouraged to go to Raleigh on Saturday the 2nd, and we're going to have a carpool group that's going to meet at First Pres in Greensboro that morning of March the 2nd. Please consider whether you can make time for one Saturday morning to support this work. If you can come, please email me. When I'm done talking, I'll put my email in the chat. Another justice issue we talk about these days is justice for the planet. We're going to see if we can get the earth care congregations in the presbytery and the earth care congregation wannabes together to exchange ideas and see if there are possible areas of collaboration. 
We're going to start with a Zoom meeting sometime in March. There will be a sign-up link for it in the Peace and Justice newsletter this month, and I'm going to send it to John for next week's Salem Matters. So if you are an earth care congregation, if you're in an earth care congregation or a wannabe congregation, please pass this information on to whoever in your congregation is leading that work and see if there will be interest in them participating. And while we're talking about this, Tony's trying to get a list together of all the earth care congregations in the presbytery. So if you haven't already done this, please email Christine Ratledge at the presbytery um, telling them that your church is an earth care congregation if it is. I want to remind you that Peace and Justice has grant money available for projects related to Peace and Justice. And I thank Liz for showing everybody where to find the grant forms. Uh, mm -hmm. The forms for the Peace and Justice grants are in the same place that she showed uh, in her screen share. You just click on Peace and Justice instead of, I don't even remember what the name of that committee was, instead of whatever other committee she was showing. Um the next book for our book club so that you can be reading it is Dear White Christians by Jennifer Harvey, which will be discussed in April. I drove to Florida this weekend and I bought the audio book version of that book so that I could listen to it on the way. And I, I recommend that as a way, if you're going to be traveling, as a way to get some of these books read that are important, but we, we all are so busy, we don't really have time to read them. And finally, uh, as always, we invite any who are interested in, to, in, uh, to sign up for the Peace and Justice newsletter. There's always a link in Salem Matters. And if you would consider joining the Peace and Justice Task Force, um, do so by emailing me. And I will hand off to Matt Bussell, who is going to tell us about the Matthew 25 Summit. Thanks, Karen. So I had the privilege of going to the Matthew 25 Summit, which was in January 16th through 18th. And uh, there are three members of Salem Presbytery who attended. Um, but before we get into the summit, I want to kind of back up and do a big level. What's Matthew 25? It's just a quick reminder. So Matthew 25 is a movement within the Peace USA which urges congregations and made councils to move beyond their walls and to join the work of Jesus amongst the marginalized in our communities. There are three foci of the movement, building congregational vitality, eradic eradicating systemic poverty, and dismantling structural racism. At the last General Assembly in the summer of 2022, three intersectionalities were added, uh, climate change, gender justice, and militarism. So congregations and make councils all join this movement, but they discern how they live into each of these priorities. And they don't have to focus on all of them, but can choose where they focus their attention. So the Matthew 25 Summit, like I said, was uh, January 16th through 18th. It was held at New Life Presbyterian Church in Atlanta. There are 350 participants with another 80 on the wait list, and they're able to live stream the plenaries and sermons, which are now available on recording, which I'm going to put in the chat. So if you're interested in going back and watching those, I just dropped that in there. Uh, they had the Reverend Hadari Williams, who's the pastor of New Life. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Diane Givens Moffitt, who is the president and executive director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency Board. The Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who is a lifelong advocate and community organizer. She's also the director of the Cairo Center at Union Theological Seminary in New York and the national co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. And then there is also um, the, the Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, who is a Palestinian Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem, and the Reverend Dr. William Yu, who is a pastor of uh, or a professor of church history at Columbia Theological Seminary. So these seminary, uh, these sermons and plenaries and workshops focused on different aspects of the Matthew 25 movements and how they can be applied in the local congregation. So the one that I'm going to focus on right now is eradicating systemic poverty. 
there's a recognition in many congregations in our presbytery and in our um, throughout our work that poverty is a major issue. And we have various programs in our churches. We we do backpack programs. We do feeding programs. We provide emergency assistance. And that a lot of them focus on short-term immediate needs. But what the summit and what Matthew 25 really focus on is taking the next step to moving beyond those immediate needs to addressing the systems and structures that make people poor. So as we move to doing this next step, one of the th ways that we do this is through advocacy and community organizing. And so as Karen mentioned, we have an upcoming opportunity on March 2nd in Raleigh to be a part of an advocacy movement of the Poor People's Campaign, calling for change and advocating for the rights of the poor in our community, in our country, in our neighborhoods. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Margaret, who is not on yet. Okay, so the other participants are not on because we are way ahead of schedule. So I'll talk a little bit about racism. I'll just keep talking about the summit then. Um, so the, one of the things about the points about racism that William Yu really hammered home is that oftentimes churches are focused on comfort rather than justice. And as churches, we are called as to, to work for justice, to follow Jesus into the margins and to uh, be agents of renewal and justice. And so what he focused on, interestingly, was to prioritize responsibility and repair over guilt and privilege. And so when we look at these issues, we can't just say that the church is, is a spiritual institution that it can just focus on its um, own spiritual life, but we are called to follow Jesus into the community, to to do the work of bringing about justice and equality. Um, if you are interested in joining the Matthew 25 movement, there is always room for more people in this, more churches, more congregations, more uh, mid councils. Um, and you may be thinking, you know, my church already does the Matthew 25 work. We're already involved in the hunger ministry. We're already an earth care congregation. We're already doing gender justice work. So what, why should I join or why should we join the Matthew 25 movement? And the reason why we join this movement is not necessarily because we as a particular congregation are going to benefit from it, but because it helps us see who else is doing this work. We can see who our partners are in doing justice work in the Presbytery. So I happen to be serving on the Presbytery Mission Agency Board right now and chair the Matthew 25 team. So if you have any questions that you want to talk to somebody about, about Matthew 25, you're curious, uh, please feel free to drop me an email or have me come and chat with your congregation. And I'm happy to do that. I'm going to... Um, I would happy to be happy to talk to you about what it means to be a Matthew 25 congregation. I'm currently serving at First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro, so I'm in a large congregation setting right now, but I've served in other smaller congregations that have done this work as well. Um, my previous church was 133 members, and so this is important work that a church of any size can do, and I'd love to um, talk to you about how we can do it together. One of the ways that we can do the Matthew 25 work is by supporting other organizations who are already doing the work. And one such partner is Living Waters for the World. And Kendall Cox is here from Living Waters to share with us about their good work. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just want to say amen to those words that you just shared. Living Waters for the World is a Matthew 25 uh, entity. And thinking about what you said about let us not be focused on our own comfort, but on justice and let us be agents of, uh, you know, transformation of renewal and repair. And that is really what we feel called to do. So. I'm going to share a few slides with you this morning, uh, Madam Moderator, if I may. 
Um, so uh, as Matt said, I'm Kendall. I'm the Director of Education for Living Waters for the World. And I'm joining you today from the Synod of Living Waters. And I am the, uh, the um, uh, here in St. Andrew Presbytery. I'm seeing some familiar faces and uh, names. So shout out to those of you who have been through our training school uh, and our many friends uh, as well. Uh, Living Waters for the World believes that all God's children deserve clean water and a chance to grow up uh, to be healthy and strong. Uh, these twin sisters here, Marielis and Mareli, uh, they are twins from Belize. Their mom gave me permission to use their photo here. And they now have access to safe drinking water, thanks to a partnership between their community and a church in Kentucky. It's our prayer that they grow up healthy so that they can make a difference uh, in their community, just like their mom, who is an operator of the water system and also the president of the community's uh, water committee. So one of the things that Living Waters for the World does is we teach teams uh, at our five-day training school, Clean Water U, uh, and our model is train the trainer so that there are more and more people through Clean Water U um, who go on to train other people. Uh, we've trained over 3,000 uh, and they go home and teach other members of their church and also communities around the world. Um, so here's how this usually works. A church or civic organization sends a team of at least three people to Clean Water U, and each member of the team takes one of three different workshops. And I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about each of those workshops. You have people here in your presbytery who um, have gone through Clean Water U, and I'm gonna ask them to drop into the chat uh, so that you know that you have somebody you, someone you can reach out to uh, right in your neighborhood. So the first, Workshop is partnership management. So this is the person who's going to sort of oversee the partnership. They are going to work uh, out some of the details of the covenant that uh, is made between the church and the community. They will work on a project preparation plan to make sure that this partnership runs smoothly and uh, that it is indeed sustainable. The second uh, workshop focuses on health education, and uh, we teach local teachers who will teach others uh, in the community, everyone who uh, is, is there. The importance of hand washing, which is something that we all uh, need lessons in and reminders to do, and also how to util utilize that purified water. So here in this picture, you see some of our local teachers uh, from Ghana to El Salvador to Nicaragua, uh, uh, teaching their local community on an ongoing basis in order to improve the health of that community. And the third workshop focuses on water system training. Uh, so these are some of our operators uh, in Peru and Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, and they are trained how to put the system together, how to operate it, how to maintain it. And we have water systems that have been working for uh, not just one year, but five, 10, 15, even 20 years. Imagine the impact that that uh, sort of shift in health can make. So Living Waters for the World has over 1,100 water partnerships from right here in the United States. That some, some uh, surprises people, but contaminated water is everywhere, stretching across the world to 27 other countries as well. So God has continued to teach us uh, through our water partners over the last 30 years, and uh, we seek to uh, incorporate those lessons into our training. One of those is a relationship-based approach to the work that we do. You see that equipment behind um, Ansi from Haiti, he's our in-country director, and Robenia from Guatemala, she is our in-country director there. That's important equipment, that PVC, that pump that's right in the middle of that heart, but we cannot put 
uh, the hardware before the heart. We must put the people before the, that pump and that PVC in order to make it uh, sustainable. Something else we really focus on is that we do this work together with our partners. We are not seeking to do something for them. Uh, and we feel that that's how God calls us to work for each of us to bring our gifts to the table. We also have learned that uh, it's best to work within networks. And so we have 11 networks around the world where we have staff. These network staff uh, help to come alongside us as partners from the US and our partners in country. And we consider these 27 staff members to be essential to our work. They don't just interpret words, they interpret culture. They help us to uh, be better partners and we're very grateful for that. Uh, we are ever, ever grateful to and give thanks for the gift of being part of a connectional church. Uh, God's given us all kinds of partners to uh, help clean water to flow. The Synod of Living Waters has established a fund which will be an endowment to support our partner communities all over the world uh, so that they can continue, continue producing clean water for generations to come. So we've been fortunate uh, to have received support in the past from churches who've made the decision to dissolve and have faithfully chosen for part of their legacy to be designated to help sustain clean water partnerships. So we're grateful to the Senate of Living Waters for the World um, for establishing this fund. It's going to allow us um, to receive funds from faithful churches, from church capital campaigns, as well as from individuals uh, who want clean water to be part of their legacy. If you were at the Association of, uh, of Partners in Christian Education, you would have seen that Living Waters for the World has uh, a new edition of our uh, full church curriculum. It's called Water All Around the World. So not just a VBS, it's also um, a way for youth as well as adults to learn about the world water crisis and the difference that we can make uh, by working together. So I'd like to close by introducing you to a little girl that I met in Liberia last year when I was traveling with a team and we were working to uh, establish a partnership with her community. This is Promise. She's the little one who has uh, a, a baby on her back. That's her little sister. And um, I met Promise uh, last year and part of her job as being a firstborn uh, is to, uh, is to go each day and to get the the water that the family needs for the day. Now she would go to a well uh, in in her community, but if that well was dry, uh, she would have to walk to a nearby pond and fill up her water container that uh, might weigh over 40 pounds. So this was quite a chore. And not only did she miss school because of that chore, she also missed school because the water was contaminated and it would make her sick. Um, so if your only if your only choice is to have contaminated water, that's going to have a big impact on your brain development, on your growth, really for your whole life. So this was the situation that this community found themselves in, and they reached out to uh, Living Waters for the World to see if there was a partner who could help them. Uh, and we, we saw that God was writing a very different story, one community at, at a time, especially with this um, partnership. You're looking at a ultraviolet system that is solar powered and it is the first one in Liberia, thanks to the partnership of this community and uh, a church, a Presbyterian church in Texas. Uh, and uh, we're ever grateful for, um, for what is happening there in Guiale. Here is Promise leading a dance troupe at the closing celebration. And she's holding up a little sign to teach everyone there the importance of hand washing and how to utilize the water. So in closing, I would like to um, say to all of you that um, God is definitely writing a different story. Uh, it's our dream for all communities to have a choice like Guiale did. 
And uh, to do that, we're going to need some more water partners. So we'd like to invite all of the churches of Salem Presbytery uh, to partner with us on this transformational work that God's calling us to. On page 38 of your Presbytery packets, you're going to find some information about Living Waters for the World. I'm going to put my contact info also in the chat, uh, and I would ask that you uh, reach out to me, uh, share this information with your church and your mission committee, and uh, may we find ways that we can work together to be a part of this transform transformational work. Um, Madam Moderator, that concludes my remarks, uh, and I want to thank you all for uh, your um, uh, faithful service uh, as God's partners. Thank you for your report. Uh, let me just ask if there are any questions. Hearing and seeing none, I'd certainly encourage you to follow up if there are questions and uh, I'll learn more about this wonderful and vital ministry that is taking place in so many places throughout the world. So thank you again for the report. We move now for any new business. I don't believe we have any today. And did we complete everything for Peace and Justice Task Force? Actually, moderator uh, Elder Margaret Arbuckle from the First Church Greensboro has joined this meeting and was to address us as a part of the Peace and Justice. If we have yeah. the time, may we recognize her? I think we have the time. We can recognize, okay, Elder Margaret Arbuckle. Well, good, mor good morning, friends. Um, I apologize for being a little late. I just really was just enjoying the beautiful day and and didn't click in quite as soon as I should have. I was lucky enough to be able to go to the Matthew 25 Summit and uh, particularly wanted to lift up the work that was done on, on addressing anti-racism work and uh, we had the had the opportunity to have uh, the author of this book on the history of of uh, our church in being anti-black, and it, it's uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to bring him to North Carolina. He's on the uh, teaching staff at the seminary in Decatur, Georgia, and he is so. Um, uh, personal in his in his uh, in his communication but also so thorough and I think until his whole point is until we acknowledge the history of our church and the history of us as white people we can't move beyond uh, our racism in our society and so we are hoping that we can bring him to North Carolina and share him with all of all of you. But there are a couple of things in particular that I wanted to uh, lift up. And one is I went to a workshop of a church that is doing some real uh, meaningful work on, addre on addressing white supremacy and gave some ideas on how we can connect into our churches and really examine our churches as to what way in what ways we display white dis supremacy in our organization of our church and the work of our church. And then the other thing I wanted to lift up was something that I think that uh, within our church at First Presbyterian in Greensboro, we have wrestled with, and that is, how do you get involved in issues that are perceived to be political in, in our society? And like, like uh, delivering of health care to all or, or, or making certain that our children are having a, a quality education, all those things get kind of got tied up, get tied up in the in the political specter. And it was a very strong message in the in the many presentations at the at the summit that our work as Christians is to be engaged in the community. And certainly the Matthew 25 Said, speaks to that very directly and, and that it encourages us to get involved in addressing the issues that 
that reflect our racism in our society and how we can uh, make changes to make the world a fair and, and, and place of equality for all. So thank you for letting me interrupt the meeting and, and add, add some comments from, and I'm just so sorry all of you weren't at this summit. It was really very moving and impactful and engaging. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your report and sharing of that information. Have we completed our report? Thank you all for your input today. And I apologize for my technology. Having no new business, we move now to the installation of our new moderator for Salem Presbytery. on page 39. Lead a life worthy, worthy of, the, of the calling to which you have been called. Making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, and spirit. just as just you were called, we called to the one hope of our calling, one Lord, one, Lord, one, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above, above all and through all and in all. We are called, called by God to be the church of Jesus Christ. A sign in the world of today of what God intends for all humankind. The call of Christ is to be willing, dedicated disciples. Discipleship is both a gift and a commitment, an offering and a responsibility. Steve, the grace bestowed on you in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. God has called you to particular service as moderator of the Presbytery of Salem. Do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus, to love neighbors and to work for the reconciling of the world? I do. Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, intelligence imagination, imagination, and love? Relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I will with God's help. Do you, members, commissioners, and educators of Salem Presbytery confirm the call of God to our brother Steve as moderator of this presbytery. We do. We do. Will you support and encourage him in this ministry? We will. We will. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us and by your Holy Spirit, you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Steve to this time and place. Establish him in your truth and guide him by your Holy Spirit, that in your service, he may grow in faith, hope, and love, and be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Almighty God, 
Holy Spirit, let your church so that we may be joined in love and service to Jesus Christ, who coming to meet us in the promise of your kingdom. Is coming to meet us in the promise of your kingdom. Amen. Steve, you are installed to service as moderator of Salem Prison. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. It is also with honor and praise that we thank Dr. Katrela Hanna for her service to Salem Presbytery for the last two years. And it's not like she didn't have anything else to do. She is an energizer bunny that keeps family and church family, community, school ties, and Presbytery ties all balanced and active. And I can tell you something I didn't know a year ago. She's pleasant, gracious, interesting, and just fun to be around. I encourage you to make uh, your acquaintance with her, if you can, after we're not in a Zoom meeting. She's taken us from meetings that were entirely in Zoom to actual in-person meetings where we we get to see each other face to face. She has more importantly, as my friend Travis Milam up in, the, in Pilot Mountain says, kept us on task and on time, whatever the format. Uh, a moderator's task is simple, but not necessarily easy. It is to see that a meeting is conducted as close to the time as possible and how, by moderating the passions, the opinions that can take over a, a seemingly uh, mundane discussion, or as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, by let all things be done decently and in order. I will attempt to do so for the next two years, and I thank you for, my, for your confidence in me. Are there other announcements that uh, need to be made at that? Then with me, let us give thanks for the service of Katrelia Hunter, God of grace. We thank you for the gifts of ministry given to your servant Katrelia. We celebrate the years of her faithful work as our moderator. Give her the sense of fulfillment and completion and inspire her with new and continuing opportunities for service to this body and for the living and for living the good news of your love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then as my first official act, I would uh, ask for a motion that uh, we be adjourned. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, if, since we're on Zoom, please do not stand for the benediction and charge. Go forth from this place as God's own. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, and patience. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you and crown all these things with love, which binds together everything in perfect harmony harmony and may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I declare us adjourned.